Um, Professor uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasser currently ranks as one of the world's foremost philosophers. The breadth of his work extends from quantum physics to Persian literature, including such diverse subjects as metaphysics, philosophy of science, aesthetics, environmental philosophy, religion, and philosophical anthropology. A philosopher uh, with a global reach and vision, Professor Nasser's far-reaching importance was duly acknowledged when the Library of Living Philosophers, LLP, commissioned a thousand page volume to critically engage his philosophy from multiple vantage points. Since its inception in 1939, the LLP has included in its library some of the greatest names, uh, greatest of the 20th century's Western philosophers and scientists, namely um, Whitehead, Bertrand Russell, Einstein, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, WVO uh, Quine, Gadamer, Davidson, uh, Richard Rorty, and Hilary Putnam, and many others. So this is really on another level. Um, professor Nasser is currently university professor at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Author of over 50 books and 600 articles, which have been translated into several major Islamic, European, and Asian languages. Professor Nasser is well-known and highly respected intellectual figure, both in the West and the Islamic world. An eloquent speaker with a charismatic presence, Professor Nasser is a much sought after speaker at academic conferences and seminars, university and public lectures, and also radio and television programs in his area of expertise. Possessor of an impressive academic and intellectual record, his career as a teacher and a scholar spans over six decades. Born in 1933, Professor Nasser began his illustrious teaching career in 1955 when he was still a young and promising doctoral student at Harvard University. Over the years, he has taught and trained an innumerable number of students who have come from the different parts of the world and many of whom have become important and prominent scholars in their fields of study. For Professor Nasser, a quest for knowledge, specifically knowledge which enables the, the human to understand the true nature of things and which furthermore liberates and delivers him or her from the fetters and limitations of earthly existence has been and continues to be the central concern and determinant of his intellectual life. We are really, really honored to have such an esteemed guest. Thank you, uh, Professor Nasser, and let me hand over the microphone to you right now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dr. Farooq, thank you very much for this kind introduction. I'm glad to be able to speak a few minutes to you about a subject that you chose for me, you and Dr. Rostam, uh, about which uh, for thousands of years, Books and books and books and books have been written. Much has been said. A subject which has also become very critical with the rise of modernism in the sense that a lot of people in the West, in Western Christianity, left religion because they could not answer the question, if God is good, why is there evil? In the various modifications and variations of the subject, as all of you know, who have studied Western thought, permeate both Western philosophy and Western literature, not to speak about Western theology, mostly Christian itself. The Islamic point of view is very different. Now that there was less evil of, let's say, people dying of poverty in Isfahan than in Paris in the 12th century. But you'd never have seen any Muslims turn against God because of the presence of evil. And the one or two people who are now saying these things, Muslims are already westernized Muslims, who think to be perfectly westernized, you should also have the same pains, knee pains as Western people do. So they've adopted this 
pain in their knee. But this is a purely artificial matter. And over all these centuries, all the debates that were carried out about the question of good and evil, about the question of why created the world, the remarkable discussion of people like Ghazali, like Imam Fakhreddin Razi, of Ibn Sina, of the Sufis, of Ibn Arabi, and so forth, that uh, all of this always was based on accepting that God is real and he is good, but nevertheless, there's the question of evil and how to solve it. And the presence of evil does not affect the reality of God. So let me say that as a preamble, and begin to discuss this very contentious and difficult issue, try to get a handle on it by saying a few words, which I feel are key. Uh, first of all, uh, let's ask the question, what is evil? What is evil? Let me point out at the very beginning that in the Islamic tradition, the word for evil is op, one of the words. And the word that is opposed to it is hus, goodness. But also these words mean ugliness and beauty. And so from the Islamic point of view, you could say that goodness is that which is beautiful and evil that is that which is ugly. Let's keep this in mind as we carry out our discussion. Now, there have been certain uh, metaphysicians and Sufis in the Islamic world who said there is no evil. Even Rumi speaks about that. But you have to understand what he means. The absolute, al al butlaq wujud al-haq, the absolute in itself has no evil in it. Evil doesn't exist. And the absolute ultimately is the only thing that is. So evil does not have an ontological status. That's what the uh, Sufis may, uh, mean when they said there is no evil. Evil does not possess existential reality like goodness does. Because goodness and what is called evil both have being, and being was created by God. And God said, Ma khalaqna hadha batala in the Quran. We did not create this in vain. The creation is good. Therefore, there's not an equivalent juxtaposition between good and evil ontologically from a metaphysical point of view. It's a very, very important point to understand. Many Islamic thinkers tried to grasp with this difficult issue that on the ethical, practical level, the dualism by which the pre-Islamic Iranian religion like Zoroastrianism and Manichism were defined, that is dualism between good and evil, between Ahura Mazda and Ahriman and so forth, uh, that dualism works perfectly well on the ethical level but not on the metaphysical level, there cannot be two divine principles. And so Islam tried to grapple with this issue and understood how while in the absolute, there's only the absolute, there's nothing else. There was God and there was nothing else with him. And the Islamic metaphysicians have added Al-An Kama Khan, and it's now as it was. That point of view is always there. That's the supreme point of view. And so this assertion in certain Islamic texts that there is no evil must be understood in light of this point. Otherwise, the Quran, every other page, refers to some form of evil and warns man against uh, performing evil acts. Anyway, uh, if there is no evil, then why do we see evil? This is still an important, very, very important question. Evil is not unreal. It doesn't have a reality of its own, but it's not unreal. It is as real as the shadow under that tree where you go sit down, you feel cool, or for the sun, it has some kind of reality. 
but a shadow is really the absence of light. And uh, as I said again, evil, although real from a certain point of view, it's as real as we are under plane of relativity, is itself not ontologically real in the sense that I mentioned. Now, <clears throat> there's also this point to add, which uh, the Sufis have always spoken about, that's really the most important way of understanding why there is evil. If we conceive of God as light, after all, he himself mentions Allah, Nur, Samawat, and Balart. If you got, if we conceive of God as the light of lights of Nur and War, light was well, somewhere illuminates. As you move away from it the illumination becomes less and less, and darkness becomes more and more pervading. So you get so far away, but it's only darkness. But darkness is not another substance like light. It's simply the absence of light. Now, evil is seen in Islamic inner teachings in this way. Only God is good. Now, God creates. Creation implies separation. Separation from the source. And that separation means the gradual weakening of the light of that sun. And the crystallization of that separation is what we call evil. If you understood this one sentence that I said, you will understand everything about evil. That was not an easy sentence. Uh, that was not an easy sentence. That is, ultimately, evil is separation. Dante says so beautifully in the Divine Comedy that evil is separation from God. Sin and evil are separation from God. Evil is ultimately separation from <laughs> God. And so, on the human plane, ordinary human beings that we are, we live in separation from God, even as as real as we are. We must therefore understand the saying of someone like Rumi and not misconstrue it. It was one of the great errors of the modern world, which not only relativizes evil, but sometimes denies it of having any ultimate significance by relativizing and relating it to social norms, laws, and injustices in this society or that society. No, it's much deeper than that. That's why you have had evil in every society. As you have had good in every society. The same way you have had the light of the sun shine on every country from Finland to Japan and also shade, as can be seen from Finland to Japan. In the same way in the metaphysical field, the goodness that is God as in his creation has something of that goodness with it, but also has that separation, that elongation. If there were no separation from God, there would be no creation. So creation implies limitation. Limitation from the separation of that which is absolute and infinite. And from that comes evil of various forms. Now, one of the greatest dangers that modern people face, I just alluded to that, but I want to come back to it before I leave the subject, is to deny evil on the level of relativity. That is, instead of denying evil on the level of the absolute, to deny evil on the level of relativity. It's the same sin as absolutizing the relative, which is, of course, the cardinal sin of modern atheism from a theological point of view and error from a philosophical point of view. Like uh, these people who say, everything is relative. Of course, except the statement that I make that everything is relative. So they're talking absurdity. Whenever there's absurdity, that's all over the place. 
all over the place. We, we have to evade these, we have to escape these. And it's how remarkable that Islamic thought, even before modern times, was fully aware of these matters. Of the relativization of the relative. And not to confuse the relative with the absolute. That is different from uh, what uh, some sages like Philip Schoen have called the relatively absolute. That is the manifestation of the absolute in a relative way that is something has something of that absoluteness in it. Like the Quran has something absolute in the Islamic revelation. There's no, there are other books that compare to it, something absolute to it. But the Quran is not the absolute, it's Allah who is the absolute. But one must make this distinction. Anyway, let me conclude uh, this section where I'm, I'm talking about uh, sin and evil. The two are related. Sin is a theological thing that people don't like anymore, so they don't use it anymore. When everybody's sinning, it's the best thing that's not to use the term anymore. Saying it doesn't exist, you know, how human beings are. Uh, but uh, come back to this question of beauty and ugliness. This what I said at the beginning. This is not a superficial matter. It's not a superficial matter. In traditional civilizations, the good was considered to come from God. And principles that were supposed to come from God and revelation were principles that were used to create that civilization. And one of the most remarkable features of traditional civilizations is the presence of so much beauty and so little ugliness. A stable in which Christ was born was probably much more beautiful than one of his modern churches built on M Street here in Washington, D.C. There's no doubt about it. We, have, we know that. That's why we're tourists. That's why we go visit those old sites, which were simple, but even stables where horses were kept or animals were kept. So uh, the, this idea was very, very central, especially in Islam. Especially Islam, where you have the central hadith, which I've quoted for many of you in other, on other occasions. Allahu jamilun yuhibbu jamal. God is beautiful and he loves beauty. So our whole attachment to God, God involves God's love. And therefore, if you love God, you must love what God loves. And that means you must love beauty. And Islamic civilization was remarkably successful in creating things of beauty. From the carpets on which people sat to minarets from which Adhan was made. And all the objects, buildings, uh, surfaces and so forth in between. I will not go into that. It's not a lecture on Islamic art, but I want to draw your attention to the importance of this. And to say from the Islamic point of view, in a sense, aesthetics and ethics are not separated from each other. Evil has to do with ethics. Ugliness has to do with aesthetics, but the two are closely related together more inwardly. And this is totally different totally different from the view that's now prevalent in many religious circles even in the West and even to some extent in the Islamic world. The Muslims have done a good job in matching Westerners and building ugly mosques. We're not too far behind, a little bit behind, not that, not that much behind because they haven't built as many new buildings. Uh, so let's not take pride in that. But traditionally, traditionally, we always related the two. Goodness has to do with the beauty of the soul. Evil has to do with the ugliness of the soul. Even in English, you say, I did something ugly. Or this was an ugly act. It never means a good act. It means an evil act. Finally, before leaving this question of evil, a very, very important point comes up. And that is, what is our responsibility before evil? This is an issue for another day. I'm not going to get into, the, in, into it, except to allude to this very important point, that in 
the Islamic perspective, especially, I don't want to talk about other religions now, but the, my own religion, about the Bible which I know a little bit, I'll give myself the permission to, to say something about it. In Islam, uh, we are always responsible for our actions. If something happens for which we were not responsible, we will not be judged by God for its consequences. If supposedly uh, I was driving too fast and I hit so someone running across the street, I'm responsible. But if I was driving 50 miles an hour, somebody wasn't looking and some father was beating his son and the son was running away and running in front of the car, I'm not responsible. So the question of responsibility is not only in the act itself, but also in the conditions of the act. What is evil is what we know to be evil and nevertheless, we commit it without free will. Without free will, if you had no free will, you couldn't commit evil. The issue of the Asharites faced and they had to solve it. A very complicated ethical issue. But uh, many schools of Islamic thought, especially Sufism, of course, we believe that the, in the freedom of the will. And we believe that committing evil presumes having free will. Obviously, as you have to do something evil knowingly, not that you're not aware, not that your boss tells you this is a, a bottle of vitamins, go and pour it in the reservoir and you do that, and, but it was not vitamins, it was poison and people get uh, sick. That is not, that would not be your fault. So the question of responsibility in relation to evil is very, very important. And I want to conclude my little discussion with what is evil with the question of knowledge. Without knowledge, it cannot really be evil. We have to know what's good and bad. That's why all sacred scripture emphasizes this point so much. We have to know what God wants of us. The question of what is good and what is evil itself, what to the divine will and those are, those are theological questions dealt with in its tradition with, the, with a few theologians and philosophers. But uh, the rest of us know that certain things are good, certain things are evil. And in order not to do it, we have to use our will. And we first of all have to have the knowledge. If you didn't have the knowledge, as I said, you would be innocent. Ignorance is innocence in this sense. However, we are also required to try not to be ignorant. That's again a question of responsibility. But suppose if we, did, we did not want to be ignorant, we couldn't find the right teacher, somebody didn't tell us about this particular act, particular substance, and we are ignorant, ignorant of it. Ignorance does not therefore hold, uh, hold us responsible for an action that comes through that, as far as evil is concerned. His physical consequences may be terrible, psychological consequences may be terrible, but as far as moral responsibility is concerned, because evil has to do with morality, we cannot be held responsible. Now, uh, before my time runs out, now let me turn to the second point I was asked to speak about the question of suffering. Again, you might say that suffering comes from separation from God. That's, that's it, one sentence, that's it. When we were in paradise, close to God, we did not suffer. Suffering comes from separation, in a sense, from who we really are, from our fitra in Islam, from our primordial nature. We who have fallen on earth, who have fallen away from who we are really. But nevertheless, we carry something of that within us. And the whole of religious life is to return to, our, to the real us, the real being, to how God created us, to the fatra, 
And suffering, therefore, has to do with loss of identity, in a sense, more than anything else. But that's the, the height of it. With that comes all other forms of suffering that human beings experience, from physical pain, psychological pain, suffering of economic kind, all kinds of things, wars, pestilence, everything that comes about, obviously. There's, however, a very important difference in the use and interpretation of this universal human experience in the religious life. And this is important to mention because I'm speaking here in Washington in a place that was, was found by Christians. There were Christians, it's still a dominant religion and Christian ethics and ideas are still prevalent among secularists. It's a very important point to mention. Uh, Christ suffered. I suffered in a way that the prophet of Islam did not suffer. The prophet also suffered. But Christ suffered on the cross. Whether he was actually crucified or not, or not, I'm not going to get into that. But uh, he was pinned to the cross. He suffered excruciating pain. And the image of Christ in the Christian mind the cross being the sacred symbol of Christianity, is Christ suffering. Have you ever seen a picture of Christ laughing on the cross? The famous paintings of Velasquez, of uh, uh, Michelangelo, of, uh, uh, even Giotto, uh, it's, uh, uh, there are other scenes of Christ's life where Christ is smiling, but on the, Christ, on the cross, he suffered, he was in pain. Sometimes he had his head down like that, sometimes looking. But it was a, the, so the epitome of pain. And so suffering plays a special religious role in Christianity that it does not in Islam. Even Buddhism, which shares with Christianity in pointing attention to the, to the fact that this world is suffering, but has different uh, lessons to learn from it. The image of the dying Buddha is Buddha reclining and resting like that very, very peacefully. He doesn't die in suffering. Christianity is special in this sense and because this is a very important religion, many people are influenced by this, the question of suffering. And again, the question has come up, where does suffering come from? Now, <clears throat> in the Islamic world, uh, again, this was never a problem. Uh, suffering was considered a part of human life. Some people suffer more, some people suffer less, some people know why they suffer, some people do not know why they suffer. Maybe sometimes people come to me asking questions like this. I just yes, that this happened. I always say that look, ordinary human beings only know this much of the trajectory of their life. They don't know really what came before. They don't know what's going to come after. You cannot judge your relationship with God and your present condition in relation to the acts that you have performed or not performed on the, only this small part of the trajectory of your life, which goes to life related to from pre-eternity to post-eternity, it says. And it's a very, very, again, complicated issue, but psychological in the Islamic world, now that there's not pain, there's not suffering, there's of course, this is like uh, in the Christian world. But the way it's taken and considered is quite different. The Muslims, when they think of the Prophet, they think of all the difficulties he had, all the problems he had with the Sahaba, with the people of Mecca, with the Quraysh, and so forth and so on. But uh, they do not identify him essentially with suffering. Prophets suffering for humanity. Christ came to suffer for humanity. The prophet came to bring knowledge of the one, la ilaha illallah. And he said, qul la ilaha illallah wa that's, his, that's it, that's his message. He came to the world to say that. Everything else comes from that. The sharia, all the laws, all of these things come from that, from the this reality of, of God. So the question of suffering in its religious understanding is not quite the same in Islam as in Christianity, but of course it is a reality 
It's a reality of all human beings. And each tradition has to come in terms with it. Spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, uh, suffering should always be an occasion for us to draw closer to God. The word alab or ranch in Persian, the word for pain, for suffering, was even used by Sufis in a positive sense. There are many, many Sufi texts. We even have a famous poet, Sufi poet in India, Muslim Sufi poet called Dard, which means in Persian pain. This is Tahallus, his pen name was Dard. So uh, suffering has should have is always a spiritual element connected with it. We should take it as part of our destiny. We should not rebel against heaven because we suffer. And not stop, start questioning God why I've been good and why good things happen, bad things happen to good people and this kind of thing. That's an error for the Islamic point of view. It's prevalent in the modern world, but for, for Islam, this is not correct. God knows best. He's created us and what he should do should bring us closer to God. And this brings me up, my time is almost up, uh, to the third issue that was asked to say a few words about the pandemic. The pandemic is a very concrete lesson about everything I've said. First of all, the pandemic is evil. All right, from the human point of view, it's evil. But from the point of view of the bugs who created the pandemic, it's not evil at all. It's the expansion of their kingdom. And I hate to say this, but even from the point of view of the environment, of the preservation of the natural environment, has not been all negative. Yes, we're sad that several million people have died. But look up how much waste those several million people quit in two years. Just think about it. It's very tragic to say this, but we human beings are living in such a way that our very existence is a danger to the earth, to the continuation of life on earth. And the pandemic should be, first of all, a very good reminder. But don't think you are the Lord of the world. Nature can play the same game. And little bugs for, who meant nothing to you can outwit you even. Take you years and the best scientists to be able to do something about that. Secondly, uh, in helping us to realize our limited power over nature, you should also, and this is very, very important, remove some of the hubris of modern natural sciences which is per percolated into the whole of society, even into the fu camps of fundam Christian fundamentalists who are against evolution and so forth. But the idea that uh, science can solve everything and can do everything, they still keep repeating it, parroting it all the time, although we still cannot do it. It should bring a sense of humility, even to the scientists themselves. And this triumphalism, triumphalism, which has been wed to modern science since the 17th century, since before that's the time of Galileo, the early 17th century. From that time on, this needs to be to change. It's very dangerous for human life, for the future of the earth. And then uh, with this you should come an awareness of how precious life is how we take everything for granted. Three years ago, when we walked in the streets, we didn't think about coronaviruses, this virus, that virus, and we didn't have to wear a mask, we didn't have to wash our hands all the time, we didn't have to use the, all kinds of medicine to clean this and clean that. And suddenly it comes, suddenly it comes. It should make us more humble and it should make us realize that life is not to be taken for granted. This is one of the great sins of modern man that takes existence itself for granted, life for granted, 
or the blessings that God has given us for granted. That's my right. Now I want something else. Talk if I have my right. Did I create myself? No. Can I make my own liver? No. What did I do that I am I? Nothing. Yes, I ate so my body grew. But even when I eat, I don't know how my body grows. Or cells in my body that are absorbing the food and applying the oxygen and so forth, I'm, they're not under my control. They're doing their own thing. So it's a very, very important point now, perhaps to bring about an appreciation of the preciousness of life. With it, a sense of inwardness. You cannot re rely on happiness only outwardly. The outward world might crumble. We have to find our joy within ourselves. The kingdom of God is within you, Christ said. And the prophet said, Qalb al mumin Ashur Rahman, the heart of the believer is the throne of the divine compassionate. And finally, we should bring us greater tawakkul, greater reliance upon God, and less reliance upon the absoluteness of human will and capability. Not that we should not rely on the gifts which God has given us, because the fact we can do something that is comes from God, but have tawakkul, I uh, use this Arabic term because it's so important in Islam, uh, the idea of reliance, total reliance upon God. And so from this, what is negative, what belongs to the shadows, the evil of the pandemic can also come some good. There's nothing in life that happens from which one cannot draw a positive lesson. Happy are those whom God allows to do so. I think I've spoken enough. I shall stop. My half hour is open, is over, and I shall stop here. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Nasser, for that uh, extremely enlightening lecture. Uh, one, one aspect of the question of evil, of course, is that, as you have yourself said, when the light goes away, the darkness comes. Unfortunately, that means that after you speak, uh, finish speaking, Muhammad Farouk and I have to speak, and that's where the darkness will come. So <laughs> <laughs> we ask for your forgiveness. You're like the, you're like the light of the upper heavens, not <laughs> the self of the upper heavens. Look. <laughs> well, there are many questions that have been coming in, uh, one of which comes from our brother Albert Forlop, who's from Kazakhstan. And he, uh, he works on Mullah Sadra and also on Said Nursi. And he, has, he mentions here that he says that your works are very well known in the philosophy faculties uh, in his native Kazakhstan. And then he has a question, which is that he says, can we say that the issue of theodicy can only be resolved philosophically if one accepts the existence of a hereafter? Yes. Yes, definitely. Of course, all the states of being, both the hereafter and the here before, you might say, is the higher worlds of reality from which we have descended and the higher the worlds into which we shall go. And the question of descent itself, the descent of existence from one level to another, which brings about the question of theodicy. If God had not created the world, there would be no need for theodicy. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And also, this friend from Kazakhstan, giving my salams. Unfortunately, I never had the occasion of visiting those countries. But I was living in Iran. It was under Soviet rule, and British enough to not allow Persians to go into Central Asia, and I missed out. But uh, it's a part of the world that which I love very much, and it's really part of my own country, culturally, in every other way. And I wish them well. Yes. Thank you. Um, there is a, a comment here from uh, Hina Khalid, who just gave a lecture earlier today. She's at Cambridge University. She said, beautiful, 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 three times. So the sunnahs of the three. 
Thank you, Professor Nasser, for your shimmering wisdom. Her question of her didn't come. I'm sorry, I thought a question was coming. But actually, okay, so then there is a question from uh, Khalil Andani, who works on Ismaili studies, Ismaili thought. He says, if evil is the consequence... From Bali, Indonesia? Uh, 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 this Khalil Andani, he's a, a, a Ismaili, Ismaili philosophy he works in. Yes. 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 Yeah? His question is, if evil is the consequence of creation, would you say that God creates a, what? A, a consequence of creation? I think of... If evil, if evil is the consequence of creation, then could we say that God creates contingent existence by a necessary choice, or could God have refrained from creating at all? So is it is it necessary? No, God could not have. Uh, uh, God is infinite. He contains all possibilities. The infinitude in metaphysically meaning containing all possibilities. All possibilities in order to be all includes the negation of oneself in a sense. Which you also have in the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah also has a doctrine very similar to the doctrine of Zoom Zoom in the Kabbalah. And therefore, God could not be both infinite or absolute without creating the world. This is a, this is a very profound issue. So, uh, so it was the first one, but this one really needs a great deal of exposition. I'm sorry that when a question answer appear, I cannot get into it and I have to stop soon. No, thank you. Thank I'll you. take one more question. Yes. Um, well, there's one from a, a certain Abbas Hatemi. He says, Salam, please come to Tehran. So it's not a question, it's a request. He's saying, please come to visit to, in Tehran. Somebody named Abbas Hatemi. So, he's <laughs> <laughs> like Hatem Prison. Give me the address I've been in prison uh, so I know where it is. <laughs> Please tell my relatives to come to visit me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Alas, tell him that's nothing more I would love to in the world that before I die, visit my country again. But at the present moment, it's not possible. Yes. I'm not dead in Iran. If I were, I could go tomorrow, intellectually speaking. Yes. Uh, I've had so many people who follow my writings and so forth. There's so many who are opposed to them, and I don't want to get into a contentious situation at this stage of my life. Yes. But I, my heart is always present there. Thank you. I thank you, and Dr. Farouk. And, uh, thank you so much. It's really an honor to have you. Thank you. Uh, I hope the rest of your program goes well. Thank you very much. Great.